sorry, Jocelyn Stock is entitled Maya History Beyond Glyphs, The Archaeological Experience of Lacrona's Hieroglyphic Stairway 2. All right, thank you so much, Jocelyn, and the floor is yours. All right. Um, well, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, I am uh, very happy to be presenting from New Orleans. I want to thank Max and Matt for inviting me to talk tonight. And I was uh, very much looking forward to this. So tonight, um, well, I'm going to be talking about how can we recreate classic Maya histories through archaeology and um, how archaeological contexts allow us to follow the life histories of artifacts, of monuments, of buildings, and other things that we find. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, how even if it's tempting to rely so just on hieroglyphic texts, um, we really do miss the complete picture, especially if we have monuments and artifacts that have been moved around by the ancient Maya. So um, I will present data from the site of La Corona in the Maya lowlands in Northwest Petén, Guatemala, where uh, pretty much every single monument that has been found so far seems to have been moved from its original location by, uh, during the classic period at some point. Additionally, the site was heavily looted in the 1960s so I'm, I'm going to talk about my personal experience and our experience as a team with project directors Marcelo Canudo and Tomas Barrientos, who are my advisors. Um, specifically, the continuous research that we did in the ceremonial center of the site. And this is work that I did as part of my licenciatura thesis when I was a student at Universidad del Valle, Guatemala. Um, so back in the day, uh, but before I delve into that, I am going to talk a, a little bit about looting and how the study of looted artifacts has been approached. So basically by archaeological looting, I, I, I am referring to illegal excavations without proper scientific documentation that carry some expectation of financial gain. And there are obviously well, multiple reasons why this happens, uh, byproduct of deforestation, for agriculture, for cattle, um, increased so socioeconomic disparities, urbanization projects, um, lack of government monitor monitoring, among other things. And there are several issues that come with it, mostly that it destroys co the contextual information on which archaeological interpretations depend. So mostly where an artifact was deposited and what is found in relationship to it that gives detailed information on where it stands in space and time is lost through looting. Um, so not only does looting obscure the geographic origins of archaeological artifacts, but also the particular life histories of the objects and of the broader activity areas, sites, and regions that they belong to. And in the Maya lowlands, hundreds of archaeological sites have experienced extensive looting since the 1960s uh, due to demand for well-preserved artifacts by art collectors, La Corona being one of them. Um, and it was actually known as a famous site Q or Sitio Que, from which do dozens of carved monuments were looted. Um, so there are different ways in which we can see looted artifacts. On the one hand, they can be seen as rich sources of information beyond archaeological context, especially when they, when they have inscriptions, right? Um, so from this perspective, looted objects have an intris intrinsic value, and they represent a meaningful contribution for understanding ancient behaviors and specific events independent of archaeological context. Um, there is no doubt that hieroglyphic inscriptions offer unique insights on classic Maya historical events and social political relations. And in fact, advances in hieroglyphic decipherment are facilitated by the increased publication of looted monuments, vessels, and other artifacts. Um, there are several examples that show that our understanding of some key aspects of classic Maya elite culture has relied heavily on epigraphic evidence independent of archaeological context. For example, the, co the codex style dynastic basis uh, have ignited debate on the seat of the, snake of, of the snake head polity. Another example is the carved jade, uh, jade, jade 
pendant known as the Leyden Plague. Uh, it was found near Puerto Barrios uh, on the Caribbean coast of Guatemala, and it, it is believed to be originally from the central Maya lowlands. And it represents one of the earliest inscribed artifacts with a long count calendrical date and um, depicts an elite individual uh, wearing some of the earliest representations of royal, royal insignia that closely resemble later portrayals of rulers on Stella. So, um, it provides information on the development of institutionalized Maya kingship. Um, a third example is the uh, Ix style cylinder vessels that have been traced to Motu de San Jose and the Lake Petenitsa region. And well, these are only a few of multiple examples that exist of how looted artifacts have provided rich epigraphic and iconographic data on Maya culture. Um, then there's an opposite perspective that suggests that the amount of information that we can learn from looted artifacts is limited because what archaeologists can learn about looted objects is based on existing understandings of previously found examples, meaning that looted objects tend to reify presumptions of artifact use instead of adding new knowledge. So temporal and spatial parameters are lost unless there is a specific inscribed date. Um, so from this perspective, it is the context of the objects rather than the objects themselves that reveal significant information about past human behavior. For example, burial goods um, provide information on, on the identity and status of interred individuals. For a non-Maya example, we have the Olmec um, colossal heads that have been, uh, some of which have been mutilated or some uh, that may have been originally thrown and then were recarved. So their specific locations and modes of interment reveal information about different things like power dynamics, uh, ritual behavior, iconoclast practices that complement data from the monuments themselves. Um, a third example uh, is a polychrome vessels that were gifted between Maya elites as means to create political alliances. The Comcombes, for example, was found in Belize and has been traced to Naranjo's royal court. And clues on the nature of regional inter and interregional ties, such as alliances or subordinations, are lost without data of the geographical provenience of these vessels. So archaeological research is key to reconstruct the processes and the histories of the, of the objects and what led to their deposition, um, which sometimes give us a broader narrative that ra in, um, rather than the objects themselves. Um, so looted artifacts definitely have great potential to understand ancient behaviors and, and, and events independent of archaeological context. And um, in the Maya area, the study of inscribed looted monuments, vessels, and art other artifacts has been a major contribution for understanding elite culture and interregional relations. Um, but even if it is tempting to rely on hieroglyphic text, it is important to define how they correlate with material evidence. Um, so by placing artifacts and monuments within the chronology of their architectural setting, settlement, and region more broadly, we can reconstruct broader and more detailed narratives that are not always consistent with the epigraphic record. So, I'm going to move to talk about our case study, which is uh, at the site of La Corona in Guatemala, which is located in the, in the Maya bio, Biosphere Reserve in Northwest Petén. The site was occupied between the third, fourth century AD to the mid ninth century. It was, it is referred to the, uh, referred to in inscriptions as Sacnic Te or white flower. And um, the site also perfectly exemplifies the, the, the loss of historical information attributed to looting. And although dozens of inscribed monuments were plundered from the site, the close collaboration between archaeologists and epigraphers has proven to be very fruitful to answer a broad range of questions. Um, so the rich epigraphic record from the site shows that um, the local kings had a political alliance with the Canul regime um, that started in AD 520 
and lasted over two centuries until the end of the eighth century. So our excavations were focused specifically in the Coronitas group, um, as you can see here, which is the site's ceremonial group. Um, it consists of five aligned funerary temples on the east side that share an open plaza with a structure. Um, um, so I'm gonna talk about findings uh, specifically in these two structures. So this is structure 10 and this is structure nine. So structure 10, the one that is highlighted in pink, is, is a range structure. It's not, um, it's not very monumental, measures 2.7 meters in height, and it is attached on, it, on its west, west side to this pyramid right here. And both buildings have been looted. Um, structure 10 was looted on the main facade, and structure nine had a looter trench on the back part. Um, so you will see how archaeology, epigraphy, and other lines of evidence have really given us a complex understanding of the use of this space. So I'm going to start by the, be by the beginning by telling you uh, the story of archaeological research in the complex. And I'm going to explain, I'm going to show how our research questions changed with new discoveries. So from the beginning, the initial survey um, in the area found um, hundreds of polychrome shirts associated to the, to the looter trench in structure nine. Um, Mary Jane Acuna was in charge of these initial excavations and some of the shirts had glyphs suggesting that the building may have been used by royal elites. Additionally, several car blocks were found scattered on the plaza in front of both buildings. Um, the blocks had seemed to have been removed from the facade of structure 10 and they left three looters trenches that thankfully did not go very deep into the building. This is what it looks like. So you can see that um, it's not a very impressive building. It's actually just a low platform, right? So the first interventions in these structures were focused on trying to recover refuse or um, trash as mean to identify the functions of the buildings. So what were the functions? We started, the question started there, like what was the function of these buildings? So excavations yielded a large midden in a chultun dug in bedrock. Um, recovered materials include over 6,000 shirts, figurines, obsidian blades, chirp fragments, fauna, um, and paleobotanical remains that had been interpreted as a feasting event. Um, fine gray ceramics date the deposit to post seven, uh, 760. So, um, the end of the late classic and um, ceramics from this deposit are currently being studied by Carrie Paris as part of her doctoral dissertation. Um, so similar deposits were recovered from the temples on the east side of the complex um, that point possibly to other feasting events that date to the late part of the late classic. Um, so these deposits, they all share some commonalities including vessels for preparing, for storing, for serving food, um, pres presence of uh, fragments of drums, incensarios, figurines, marine shell, chert, obsidian, carbon, ashes. And additionally, we know from the Chultun that they were consuming um, deer, turtle, fish, mollusks, um, maize, chili, amaranth, and leafy greens. Um, as determined by Clarissa Cagnato and Diana Frieg Friedberg. Um, so the feasting deposit on the back of structure 10 then suggested that the building may have been used for food preparation at the end of the late classic or for preparation for these commensal rituals. Um, we actually found a cache, as you can see here. These are two comales, um, and they were found lip to lip and it is associated to the last phase of construction of, um, of structure 10. So its mundane nature might be related to the purpose of the building during this time period for, for food preparation. Um, 
So then re research shifted to evaluate structure tents use as a potential dwelling. So, um, so questions now shifted to potentially doing household archeology, span right? So we did horizontal excavations on the top of the structure, as you can see here, and we uncovered three rooms um, and a storage area with evidence of small scale domestic activities. Um, recovered materials include from fragments of um, animal bones, food plants, including sapote and manioc, grinding stones, marine shells, green stone, chert, obsidian. And uh, in comparison to what we found, what we think are the feasting, potential feasting deposits, the recovered materials, the recovered ceramics here were, were mostly for food preparation and storage. Um, the materials were not found in any particular pattern, so we interpreted as um, refuse, um, so trash, basically. Um, we also found some fragments of fine orange ceramics that date this last occupation to the Termina Terminal Classic, indicating that um, this last occupation, these materials on top of the structure, are not contemporaneous with the potential feasting events. This happened after. So probably because, um, so the, there was definitely a change in the use and the function of the building. And we think it was probably because of like broader social and political changes during this time period. Um, and we actually found remains of a, of a structure on the plaza that had similar materials as the ones we found in the rooms and shows that during the terminal classic, the area probably may have been used for residential purposes. So that year, which was 2011, we also cleaned the looter's trench on the main facade of structure 10. And actually that year, um, project directors, Marcello and Tomas had hired someone to draw um, profiles for the excavations, right? So the guy, the the artist, he took one of these blocks that you can see here to be able to sit more comfortably, right, while, while, he, was, while he was drawing. And Marcello that afternoon came to see the excavations and with the light, he noticed that one of the blocks had glyphs. Um, so we started with the workers, we started like looking carefully at each of these blocks and we recovered another one. So this showed that the building had a hieroglyphic stairway, but um, we waited until, until 2012 to start excavations um, to see if the looters had left anything behind, uh, which was part of like the systematic strategy that the project directors had. Um, so it was 2012 and Really, before going to the field that summer, I did not realize it would be one of the most memorable summers of my life. So that year, we began by cleaning the looters trenches on structure 10, as you can see here. So this is all looters back there. So they started um, removing that. And we found nine additional carved blocks on, in the looters back there. So the looters probably found um, so many monuments that they were able to choose which ones they wanted to keep and which ones they wanted to take with them. Um, these, these blocks are currently known as Set A and it's a dismantled hieroglyphic stairway and it is currently the longest hieroglyphic text in Guatemala. There are several others, other blocks in private collections, so these are not all of them. Um, so this set A stairway talks about La Corona's seventh century ruler, Kinich Yok, and his family history and the relationship with the Kanul polity. Um, so I'm not going to go into epigraphic details, but only, but it's important to know that it mentions his family history and some specific ritual events like um, ritual dancing. So although most of the car panels were looted, the looters missed the lowermost step, which we, uh, which we called hieroglyphic stairway too. So as we kept looking and basically looking at for 
for uh, examining every single blog that we found to see if it had glyphs on them or not. And lining them on a plaza, we spotted two that seemed to be in an upright position, as you can see here. Um, and this is actually a photo of the very exact moment. So they kind of like stopped and the workers just kind of like stopped and everyone just felt very happy because it seemed like those blocks were, um, were an undisturbed context, something that the looters left behind. So this is what the process of excavation looked like. So you can see Marcello is right there. And we excavated them very carefully. And we realized that in fact, it was a complete step that was missed by the looters. Um, and this is what it, end, what it ended looking like once we cleaned everything. Um, so at the beginning, we thought the blocks that we were finding were the same, the same ones, the same set that we were recovering in the, the looters back dirt. But then we started realizing that there were different sets of blocks, blocks from at least five different sources that were repositioned here as part uh, of what Marcello and Tomas have called have called a spolia event. Um, so you can see here the drawing. Um, I color coded the different sets of blocks. So seven and eight were in the middle. This is seven and eight. Um, this and this, this one and this one seem to have been, have belonged to a different set. This one was one set. Um, and these were from set A actually. Um, so they were right here and these two on the um, on, on, on the corners were actually positioned um, upside down. So, um, okay, so you can see here, this is a close up of one of the sets. Um, and again, I will not go into epigraphic details, but, um, but you need to know that all of the blocks seem to have been commissioned during uh, Canul time. So between 520 and 716, around that, that time period. Um, so we have, you can see here, the, this is uh, L-shaped blocks, L-shaped text. Um, this is an example of one of the blocks from set A that we recovered in as part of the stairway and these were in the central axis. Um, so it's Kalakmul governor, Yugnom Chen, and La Corona ruler, Sak Mas. Um, and this is a famous, a, a famous block from the stairway with the reference to the end of the 13th Batum. Um, and this was our reaction, of course. And when we uncovered it, we had different visitors, including um, Guatemalan, Funding agency Pakunam, David Stewart came. We had army guys guarding the monuments. Even a group of former looters uh, visited and seemed to be very surprised about what they found, about what we found. And they were saying things like, "Oh, I could carry one of these tiny blocks on my back," or "Oh, how much do you think each one of these weighs?" Um, so suddenly, it became a very interesting context, right? And for me, really a very a, it was really a truly, truly was a unique experience as a Guatemalan undergraduate student uh, because literally all I thought I would be doing for my thesis was excavate a house and doing some household archaeology, right? And I ended up doing, um, doing this and having this very complex context. Um, so these are the ones that we found on on the on the corners, so you can see this one. Um, there, they were both placed um, upside upside down, um, and also another monument that was repositioned here was the Dallas Altar, um, which is a monument that commemorates the marriage alliance between three canoe canoe women and La Corona rulers. And we found the carcass of this monument in the looters back dirt showing, you can see here how they used um, power tools to remove the carved surface and ease transport. 
and so the monument it, it's actually it's, it was it's actually very heavy um and we found it in the in the looters back third meaning that the looters probably found it there um so the monuments placed on the facade of structure 10 were therefore likely meant to memorialize or to commemorate the multi-generational relationship between the corona rulers and um, the canoe royal family so you can see here in relation to the stairway, the Dallas altar. Um, so it was, it, was, it was placed on top, right? So um, monuments were dismantled from their original locations and repositioned across the site core. That is not limited to structure 10, but also to the northeast patio of the palace excavated by Max. Um, so without archeological excavations, this polia event would not have been possible to identify. Um, and it, this is something, the movement of the monuments is something that would have been impossible to identify through monuments alone. So since the stairway comprises um, dismantled blocks, um, but then was partially looted, it is very difficult to interpret without archaeological data. So you can see that they that we are dealing with an excavation that had we were dealing with an excavation that had like three different levels of complexity, right? So we had the classic period building, the movement of objects by the Maya, and we were trying to figure out what the looters took and the architecture that got destroyed. Um, so this is a reconstruction that um, UVG student Camilo Najera did back in the day. Um, it should have an attached temple right here, but you can see here Kinich Yok is you being used as a scale. Um, so um, it gives you an idea of what the looters took and what we found, right? So this is the, um, the, the step, hieroglyphic stairway two and the blocks from set A were probably positioned here, and the Dallas altar was probably right there as well. Um, the exact date of the reinstallment of the monuments remains unknown, but they were placed after um, 716, which is the last recorded date in one of the blocks. And based on the amount of blocks that we found on the plaza and the height of the building, we also think that there were approximately seven steps each we had each and each had approximately 20, 20 blocks. So maybe each step had about five blocks with glyphs. Um, but those are just calculations and there's really no way we can really know. Um, so archeological excavations further support the idea that hieroglyphic stairway two was not originally set in structure 10. So the original stairway, as you can see here, is composed with rustic carved limestone blocks um, that contrast very starkly with the high quality limestone blocks that compose hieroglyphic stairway too. Um, so archeology span was able to tell us that this was not their original location. So now our research questions shifted to understand the reason for reinstalling the monuments in this particular location. The following year, excavations focused on the earlier constructive stages of the building. A cache in the final construction phase of structure nine had a polychrome vessel decorated with the image of God Kowil, stingray spines, slightly used obsidian blades, coral and shell that were, uh, were found in the interior of the vessel. So the cache suggests that rituals involving bloodletting were conducted by La Corona rulers in this area and the La Corona rulers claim some sort of authority based on their charismatic appeal as religious figures. Uh, luckily, looters did not get too deep into the building and we found nine additional dedicatory offerings that were cached in consecutive floorings of structure 10. These, these successive ded dedicatory rituals were placed along the central axis of the building six of them, which we found in 2013. So the earliest cache was placed within 
a midden in the building's earliest construction phase dated to the late Preclassic, pointing to the symbolic importance of the complex from the very beginning. Um, so you can see here, these are some of the contents of, of, the, ca of, of the deposit. Um, it had marine shells, freshwater snails, um, ceramic seals, and even a snail made out of lithic. So there might have been a symbolic significance here. Um, so you can see how they place this cache inside the deposit. And inside we had two lip to lip Aila Naranja plates with a greenstone effigy inside. Um, this is uh, once, once we clean the vessels and the, the greenstone effigy. And uh, we also found two possible mosaic, mosaics, as you can see here, uh, with different materials, including shell, um, pirate, azurite, stingray spines, um, and they were in the they were found in the plaza associated to the stairway. We also have three additional caches with vessels, bones, and shell, as you can see here, one of which had a polychrome plate that according to epigraphers comes, may come from Naman or the site of La Florida. The vessel may have been a gift and shows the relations between the elites of both sites. Um, so the meaning of all these vessels and artifacts in these caches is scars without archaeological context, especially if you take small pieces of the mosaics uh, out of context or just look at the individual vessels. But when you put them together, it gives a strong message on the symbolic significance of the, comp of the complex for the people of La Corona. Um, this is uh, further supported by the fact that our excavations show that structure 10 was initially a platform. Um, and we actually did horizontal excavations on the early platforms. And we know that the walls and the features that, um, that are seen on top were added later. So this was actually a perfect, seems to have been a perfect area for performance by La Corona rulers. Uh, with the plaza on front, and it was um, a low platform, right? And we really would not be able to know this without the whole architectural context. So the reasons why they placed um, the stairway here further uh, were further elucidated with data from burials. Um, two of the temples in the Coronitas group have burials dated to the 6th century that were excavated by Joan Barron. So the area was potentially a necropolis um, for the early Canul era, era rulers of La Corona. Additionally, in structure 10, we found the burial of a royal woman dated to the 7th century. Um, so this is burials 13, and we call it the Nagio, well, in the, in, in the, at the side, we called it the Nagio burial because, as you can see, it was very photogenic. So funerary offerings included ceramic vessels, uh, greenstone beads, spondylus shell aligned that were found aligned on top of her body. Um, also bone needles and spindle whorls that show that she may have been a weaver. Um, some, of the, um, some of the needles <clears throat> were actually found in the skull area. This is a close-up, and I think the needles may have adorned her hair when, when she was buried, um, which gives a, a, in my opinion, a strong message on identity. Also um, found stingray spines that probably served as, blue, as bloodletting implements, and one of these had the carved text, Kuch Ish Yach Kik, um, read by David Stewart as Sacred Blue Green Blood Woman, which was probably um, the name of the interred individual. But interestingly, 
this royal woman is not mentioned in any of the known, known hieroglyphic texts of La Corona. Um, monuments of La Corona that mention women or that focus on women seem to be more on the Canul ladies and not so much on the local ones. That does not mean the local women are not mentioned. They are. Um, two additional burials were um, subsequently Oh, and you can see here um, the different the different kinds of um, um, needles, bone needles that we recovered. So we had different types that probably serve different purposes. These are the spindle whorls, and um, you can see how some of these had um, were decorated on the edges. So we found two additional burials placed following um, the same alignment and orientation as burial 13, um, which we are convinced was intentional. Uh, so people probably were aware that this royal woman was buried here and then placed the, the burials of what bioarchaeologist Erin Patterson has identified as two other females. Um, this one is a non-royal elite, and this one is a commoner. Um, Burial 12 had a um, fine gray vessel, which dates the burial um, way later than Burial 13. Um, so they knew there was some sort of um, social memory happening here. Um, so why? put the staircase here. Um, we actually do not know. So the building may have been an ideal architectural setting. Maybe, maybe it was a space that was ideal to relocate monuments, architecturally speaking. Um, maybe it gave, it, it was ideal for people to see it from the plaza maybe social memory so people perhaps were aware of the symbolic importance of the complex and they chose to commemorate <clears throat> what happened there maybe the woman became an ancestor maybe they wanted to bring back the blocks to the place where rituals took place at some point um we 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 are not sure we currently do not know so putting everything together and putting everything in actual chronological sequence, we have that the building was used for rituals initially. Um, probably public rituals by La Corona rulers. Um, the successive caches that we found show the symbolic importance of the building, but also their concern for expanding areas for rituals. Um, it probably had that function all the way to the 8th century, when we have the chultun and evidence for food consumption. Um, they added walls and rooms and made it more private. So maybe private rituals, maybe food preparation. And then during the terminal classic, we have evidence of subsistence activities um, and that the building may have become a residence. Um, so with this, I hope I have shown that how the viewpoints and close collaborations between archaeologists, epigraphers, ceramicists, osteologists, and people studying diet are all important to rec recreate Maya histories and Maya narratives. Um, while looted artifacts can provide plenty of information per se, without knowledge of archaeological context and combined lines of evidence, we would not be able to know the extent to which this building and the architectural complex in general was symbolically significant for the people of La Corona. It would also not be possible to trace the movement of reposition monuments throughout the site or talk about specific relations with other royal courts. Um, so thanks to the detailed archaeological excavations, we also know um, that there was some sort of social or po political transformation because the terminal classic ma materials point to household um, activities or residential activities that contrast with all the ritual evidence from the past, from the complex. Um, so
So through archaeology, really, we really can get a much more elaborate and detailed idea of the use of space and the life histories of buildings and artifacts. Um, so as you can see, we, we came up with a very interesting narrative through our excavations. And um, to finish, I hope I also show the importance of empirical research on and how we can start with one question but end up, end up finding something completely unexpected that leads us to change our research questions along the way. Um, for me, leading excavations in this building and doing this research with all of these dimensions was, an, was truly an experience I will never forget. I am very grateful to project directors, Marcello and Tomas, and all of the archeologists that have participated in the investigations of this complex. And also thank you for, thank you to the organizers for, um, for having me tonight. That's all. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Uh, this is a perfect talk to uh, connect archeology span and epigraphy. If you wanna stop sharing your screen, we'll be able to, there you go, resume the general view. Wonderful. Uh, thanks very much for this. Uh, we have plenty of, of time for, uh, for questions and answers. So um, people can feel, uh, there's already one actually. Uh, so Marek Bunzel is saying, right now I'm working on automatic deletion detection, de sorry, detection of structures and <laughs> LIDAR data from Washaktun area using AI. It seems that looting leaves more prominent features than the structures themselves. Do you think that detection of looting trenches would be useful for the archaeological research? Oh, absolutely. Yes, definitely. I think um, the big part of the LIDAR um, research that needs to be done is really um, mapping or locating all the looted, or the, all the looted um, buildings out there, because there are, there are plenty, unfortunately. Yeah, even in the palace where I worked uh, at La Corona, the shape of the architecture before excavating it was entirely transformed by the leftovers, uh, the back dirt from the looters. It's really, uh, you were mentioning all these stones you were finding in the plaza. I, I imagine from, from a LIDAR perspective, they might as well have looked like another mound um, before they Yes, were. actually a few years ago um, when I was, uh, one summer that I was at Hobio, we I went to see a structure mm -hmm. and turned out to be a giant ant. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how do you call it? Uh, an ant hill. Yeah, an ant hill. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's that. And I remember also with Marcello. Marcello is, has a knack for, for finding things that we, I was sure some of the things that I, he's, he, thought it were structures, I was sure they were looters back there. And you know, he, he was right, some, like the, the one where they found the, the, the latest altar in the same group, at like the Coronitas group. I, I, in my mind, that was a, a looters back there, but no, he was 100% right. It was, yeah. it was a structure. So we get, it plays both. It kind of drives us to, um, to maybe recognize uh, looters back there where they are not. Um, all right, let's see if there are any other questions. Uh, Keith. I imagine Epic says, great presentation. That is not a question, Keith, <laughs> but thank you. Um, uh, all right, um, are there, we're gonna, we can chat a bit more and let people have the time to uh, compose uh, the questions. Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, so someone else, Marek Bunzel is saying that I uh, heard the story about the anthill. Yes, there is a problem with the ground verification as well. Of course, yeah, the, 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 the famous kind of, uh, uh, argument that uh, a lidar is far from being a, a magic wand, right? We we have to go in and ground ground truth. Um, although at some at the same time, uh, there are probably ways to refine the way in which we use lidar to eventually uh, really only recognize, uh, hopefully, archaeological structures. And also, all lidars are not equal. Right? I think some some that some of them have far more precise. Um, so I have a question for you, uh, Jocelyn, while we wait for more people to ask them. While working at um, La Corona and, and collaborating um, 
like constantly with everyone who was sort of supervising and then putting uh, people like Dr. David Stewart who were there to help understand uh, the epigraphy and Joanne Barron and Marcello and Tomas and all the workers. Which one is the interaction in this whole process that kind of um, perhaps remind, stays in your mind the most, uh, the most important moment in, in, in the discoveries that you made uh, in, in Structure 10? interactions in which one of your uh, collaboration should i say like where there's a moment that involves you interacting with someone else in this whole concept what, which one is the one that kind of mm. comes back to mind most often well definitely the closest well obviously um the project directors right mm. and then um the workers are fantastic mm -hmm. um they they are great and they always have different perspectives on and interpretations on the things we are finding. And I do really love to hear everything they have to say. And I respect immensely everything that I, that they have to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. As for the, um, the, the specialists, for example, ceramics, lithics, uh, mm -hmm. that comes later, right? Mm -hmm. Like more like in the lab or through like the hindsight. Yes, yeah. And also very important, um, I do appreciate very much when um, other archaeologists come, like for example, yourself, um, and give me their opinion on the context, because sometimes they see things differently from what I'm seeing, you know, so it's always good to have input from different sources to make you kind of like play around with ideas and mm -hmm. um, help you create like a story better, right? Yeah, archeologists, uh, it's such teamwork and that's the, the, the beauty. Uh, yes, the yeah, it's teamwork, it really is, yeah. I see someone raise their hand, the person raised hand, please type your, your question and then we will answer, we'll ask a question for you. Um, I, 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 I'm just really glad, yeah. Jocelyn, that someone actually appreciates Max's opinion. <laughs> So, uh, he gives me his opinion all the time <laughs> and I don't ask for it. <laughs> so I'm really, I'm really happy about that. Yeah. Well, Max also has a lot of experience in the field, you know, so I'm, I'm always happy to. Well, I think it's hear. not comfortable to yours. The, um, Even if I don't ask for it, you know, <laughs> it's just coming. I miss, coming. I miss that like Corona. It. It's been too long. <laughs> yeah. I remember when you were talking about the, the, the artist sitting on the, on the stone and uh, was that the stone on which the, the Marcello found the glyphs? I didn't know that stone. Yes, yeah. Uh, that's funny because the same thing happened right at the palace. There was this one, this kid, this new worker who like sat on a stone instructor G in the palace and he was just sitting on his block and I kind of noticed he was sitting on the block and after the, the, the Refaction. I just went and looked at the block and it was the, that was the monument that we only have like a tiny sliver of a glyph on it. And then I was like, dude, there's like a glyph on the block you're, you had your butt on. And, and then he was like mortified and all the workers were giving him the hardest time. And that was the first clue that we were about to find a, a looted staircase, just like you did. Nah, that was funny. Those are, those are good times. I think there's a new question. Um, yeah, especially oh, yeah. when you're not expecting, you know, it's... Yeah, well, that's the best part. Yeah. It makes archaeology fun. Okay, we have a couple of questions here. Mm -hmm. uh, Miguel Tsai is uh, saying, could it be a kind of history consciousness reposition and keep the hieroglyphic stairway? Well, sort of, uh, so is there a, sort of a con history of the consciousness of the history of, of, of La Corona and keeping <laughs> this hieroglyphic staircase together, right? Yes, so higher history consciousness. Yes, actually we have, we have data to actually make a good case that they, they um, brought, they maybe chose these monuments that like commemorated the Kanul um, historical narrative and brought it here. Maybe um, something that I was talking about Mar with Marcello last night actually was Maybe they were not. Maybe they were not thinking about the structure per se. Maybe they were thinking about the Coronitas ceremonial complex more broadly. You know, so they were probably just trying to find a place to put them there in the group, mm -hmm. right? 
um, I like to think as excavator of structure 10, uh, that they, that they put it, they put it there for a reason, right? Those reasons are not clear enough, unfortunately. Uh, but for example, Samantha is asking uh, on the idea of social memory related to the three burials, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, so one idea is that maybe um, this woman, even if she's not mentioned in any of the monuments, maybe she was um, someone important, you know, and someone that, that became an, an ancestor at some point. Um, the, the next burial, the, the one in the middle, we don't have a date for it, but we know that the, the, the following one, burial 12, was placed um, like 50 years later. So, and they, they are aligned. Like I'm telling you, it's 2.5 meters oh, yeah. exactly between each burial. That's something that's not, that in my opinion, that was intentional. Oh, 100%. I totally agree with yeah. you, Jocelyn. There's one, they know what's going on with this building. And sure, the, the, the epigraphic records provides a strong uh, historic component to my archeology, span but knowing that uh, archeology span itself especially carefully contextualized archaeology, allows us to fill in the blanks in this yeah. historical uh, uh, process. And that's where um, really uh, kind of um, in some way, um, um, some people have suggested that ar archaeology, historical archaeology offers something called anti-history, right? The idea that we can uh, basically use archaeology to go beyond history and and identify actors who weren't necessarily uh, uh, immortalized in the writing record, and that's what you are doing and finding the, these these women. Like what was her name, Lady Blue Blood, right? Who was entered yeah. in the, in this burial? We don't know of her anywhere else, but now thanks to excavations, we know she existed. Um, we know her name too, of course, thanks to epigraphy. So that's, I think that's beautiful. And that structure, I kept joking to you. I don't know if you remember that this was the structure of everything. You found everything. You found caches, architecture uh, that was well-preserved, um, three burials, uh, Nat Geo quality burials, of course, and the hieroglyphic staircase. This is, is this really uh, neat stuff. Uh, yeah. Let's see, uh, is there more questions? Okay, yes. Uh, uh, Hyung Tae Young is asking, does uh, structure tens change has additional relationship to other structure? If that exists, what does that possible relationship suggest? So are, is, are there uh, changes that occur at other buildings at the same time? And what does that suggest for the bigger picture? Yeah, okay, so for the terminal classic, um, this is pretty much the only area in the Coronitas group that has, that has materials from that time period. But I know that in the palace, you have Terminal Classic, Max. Um, yeah, yeah, very late. Yeah. So I also think that there is a reason for that. Why they chose to go live there, you know, why didn't, why didn't they destroy the monuments, right? Or did anything to them is a further sign of respect and of really trying to uh, commemorate, right? Mm -hmm. Of memory of this time period, probably trying to commemorate the canoe um, yeah. that Be they had. Yeah, and something that we've talked about too is beyond commemorating, it's even like as political agents, these terminal classic uh, people are perhaps uh, like basically harnessing the power associated with this, this glorious past in order to bolster their own status, saying we are the descendants of the, the, the lords of the most powerful kingdom of the classic period. And, and yeah, just exactly. empowering themselves with this this sort of colonial past in some way, which is an interesting uh, thought. And actually, Mallory's uh, presentation made me think about something. Um, one of the blocks found that we found was not finished. Mm -hmm. um, so Mallory's talk made really made me think about how, like, why, like, the what concept they had of the writing, right? If they like actually understood, but there's definitely some intentionality to how they place the blocks and mm -hmm. w how, they, how they put them, right? So- Yeah, in my mind, there's not, no doubt they could read. Yeah. yeah. So maybe they not understand 100%, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. there is like some knowledge, some memory there, for sure. We have a, we, there's another question by Martin Diedrich here. Um, Martin says, 
it's so rare that it may have been a once in the world history that an archaeologist discovers an ancient inscription that speaks directly to the very date that the archaeologist is working it in real time, bridging a large gap of time. That must have been an amazing experience. Please share what that find and revelation was like for you. Yeah, that was that was very shocking, I'm telling you. Um, because really the chances of finding a reference to the end of the 13th Bactun on the year where people were going crazy because of the 13th Bactun was kind of like, oh my God, are you the Antichrist? Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I think uh, recently, of course, the, Dr. David Stewart, who, who made the decipherment uh, on, on the spot there, recently shared a video that was made um, and where we see his live reaction to, <laughs> to it, uh, which was great. Uh, I, I think... Uh, the words that he, uh, the expletives that he used to describe his surprise uh, are not uh, the kinds of things I should say here uh, on Zoom, but uh, the reaction was quite strong. Uh, the decipher, it's, it's, it's a beautiful video. You should, if you have access to David Stewart's uh, Facebook um, post, you should go check it out. But yeah, that was so cool. Um, Graham is asking, uh, is the looting problem still as bad as it was? Um, not at La Corona, but um, at El Jovillo, which is three kilometers away, we actually found looted uh, buildings a couple of years ago. So recent, um, yeah. unfortunately. And very well done trenches, unfortunately, as well. Yeah. There's still yeah. active looting for sure. Yeah, there's still active looting. And some that we have no clue is going on for sure as well. Marcello Canuto is commenting that a uh, reminding us that a basic rule of archaeological methodology is that always check where you sit. Thank you. We will rem remember. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, that's uh, that. Those are the questions. Um, do you have any uh, parting words, uh, Justin? Um. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I was very pleasure. excited to talk about this and remember everything, you know. Yeah, it was a trip down memory lane there, 2012, yeah. that's eight years ago, even <laughs> more. Um, so uh, also I should say that uh, Jocelyn uh, ac accepted uh, to be uh, our guest editor for our next issue of The Mayanist. So uh, that's going to be really nice to, to have you on board for that. And so, uh, yeah. Um, more, you'll, you'll hear more from her in the next uh, few months uh, through our peer-reviewed journal. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. Thank you. And we'll be in touch soon.